Welcome. Uh, <coughs> the announcements for today. Uh, there, some VBS needs some help, and I'm not using it. <laughs> okay, the wall hanging here. Uh, that was one that came from our sister church many years ago, and it would be out on the table every now and then. It's not normally where you can see it. So, uh, there's, when you open up the bulletin, the place where it says, please consider uh, VBS promotions. Uh, church treasure position is going to be needed to be filled, and people that are willing to help in the nursery um, and out on the sign up thing uh, is a thing for the mission conference coming up and for the meal uh, that night you have to sign up and uh, so it's there to be signed up with and we want to thank Perry Johnson for being here today to, as the minister and <laughs> Boy, she can just signal. Um, so anyway, thank you. And we hope you have a blessed time today. And thank you much for being here. Please stand and join us in singing this morning. i 
to shout for joy in the Lord. We sing to you, Lord, a new song, for your word is upright and all your work is done in faithfulness. You love righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the steadfast love of the Lord. <clears throat> by your word, Lord, the heavens were made, and by the breath of your mouth all their host. You gather the waters of the sea as a heap. You put the deeps into storehouses. Let all the earth fear you, Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of you. For you spoke, and it came to be. You commanded, and it stood firm. You, Lord, are a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, and abounding in loyal love and faithfulness. We praise you, Jesus, whom the Father appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. You are the radiance of the glory of God, and the exact imprint of his nature, and you uphold the universe by the word of your power. After making purification for our sins, you sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. We also praise you, Holy Spirit, our helper sent to us from the Father. You are the spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, and you bear witness about Jesus. You teach us all things and bring to our remembrance all that Jesus has said. You guide us into all the truth, for you speak not with your own authority, but whatever you hear from the Father. May you, holy God, three in one, be honored and glorified in our worship and adoration today. We love you. We pray in the powerful, gracious, and all-sufficient name of Jesus. Amen. <laughs> Worship his holy name, sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship your holy name. Come, it's a new day dawning, it's time to sing your song. See 
Good morning. I'm, I'm not Matt. Matt. Matt is still coming. Um, my name is Chet. I'm the chairman of the pulpit committee and I'm going to give an update. But first I want to say thank you to Mr. Silas Nix. It's his first day running the projector today. Doing a fantastic job. And it's, it's great to have so many, uh, so many willing volunteers to help, help make things run smoothly each and every morning. So I'm going to give an update uh, for the pulpit committee. Uh, first off, I just want to introduce ourselves. Uh, as I said, my name is Chet. I'm the chairman of the committee. We also have uh, Joni. Where's Joni? Just raise your hand. Joni's over there. And Joey McGuire. And Mr. Dan Swanson is maybe... Oh, there he is. Thank you. And then very, very far away, we have Yvonne Pearson. She's not here right now. Uh, but those are the five of us uh, that are part of the pulpit committee. Uh, over the last month or so, uh, since the church voted to put together the pulpit committee, we've met uh, twice already as a group, and we've done a few things already. Uh, we've put down on paper uh, what our plan is going to be for how to work through the process uh, of selecting the, the next pastor for our church. And, and I want to give you just a, 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 some insight into the search for a pastor, and I'm going to read from the book of Titus, chapter 1, verses 5 through 9. 
In this, Paul says, this is why I left you, he's speaking to Titus, I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. If anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife and his children are believers and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. For an overseer, as God's steward, must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or a drunkard or violent or greedy for gain, but hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught, so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. And, and in a nutshell, that's, that's what we're trying to do, is uh, bring, together, bring forward to the church over the next few months uh, a candidate uh, to, be, to be our next pastor. Uh, just as a point of clarification, we are doing our work to search for the next senior pastor at Glory. The deacons are also running a parallel operation to keep the pulpit filled each Sunday morning. Uh, today we have, we have Perry, uh, whom, who many of you are familiar with already. So Steve and the rest of the deacons are actively working at keeping the pulpit filled, and then we are looking at the long-term uh, task of, of, uh, of our new pastor. So as I mentioned, we've documented our plan. We've also prepared a survey uh, for each of you to fill out. Uh, we've started a self-study to be able to document more about our church as information to share with our potential candidates. So what are the things that are next for the pulpit committee? Well, first of all, uh, as you leave today, if you may have noticed a, a empty white table out in the foyer. As you leave today, that table will have paper copies of a survey. It looks a lot like this. And, and you are welcome to please grab one or, or a few uh, paper copies of the survey. We will also be emailing the same form uh, through our church email uh, uh, software. So you can fill it out either on paper or electronically. There, there's no preference. You can do whatever is easiest for you. If you would like to do an electronic survey, but you're maybe unsure of uh, technology, have some questions, uh, Joni from our committee has volunteered next Sunday after the service to stick around for a little while with her laptop and help people go through the process. If you'd like that, that's, that's an option. Um, so uh, we'll have the survey available. It is welcome and open for any uh, members, any regular attenders. There's, there's no age requirement. Please, if you'd like to, fill out the survey. We'd like to get some information from, from everybody that we can. Uh, we are also putting together a list of, of organizations and trusted uh, ministries to whom we will be sending a letter to solicit names. Uh, for example, uh, there are a number of great seminaries, biblical seminaries down in the Twin Cities and around Christian colleges, trusted other pastors and colleagues. We're going to be reaching out to them uh, in the future to say, hey, please think about our church and send us names of people that you think might be a good fit for our body. You as members are also welcome. If you, if you say, hey, I've got a, I've got a, a, a friend or a, or a uh, relative or a coworker, somebody who I think would be a great uh, future pastor, please let us know, send us the names to any one of us on the committee. Um, we'll be happy to, to file that aside and then as we start working through names in the coming months, then we'll, we'll uh, have that name on our list. Okay, let's see here. We will also be uh, giving updates each month. That's the plan. So sometime around early to mid-month each time we'll be giving you an update. We are going to do our best as a committee to keep everything that needs to be confidential, confidential. So please don't ask us, hey, have you heard this guy and, and are you talking to him yet? Uh, we're not going to be answering questions about specifics, but we will gladly share as much as we can about, yes, we're, we're talking to a number of people, or these are the maybe quantity of, of gentlemen that we've already had communications with. We'll share general information like that, but we're not going to share any names because, as you can imagine, 
if we're working with a potential future pastor, that person might already be a current pastor somewhere else. And so we don't want to upset the apple cart with their current ministry by spilling the beans, even that they're just considering uh, working with us. So please don't ask specifics, but we will gladly share whatever we can uh, generally. Uh, and then finally, uh, as I mentioned, please grab a survey or fill it out via email. And then the most important things that you can be doing for us as a committee is to pray for us, the five of us specifically. We need your prayers. Pray for our church as a whole and pray for the future man that God would have to lead our church and his family. Uh, it's very important that he and his family are being brought along in this process. So please pray for, for all of us involved and uh, we appreciate your time this morning. Well, thank you, Chet, and the rest of the search committee. We really appreciate the work that you guys are doing. Well, let me take your attention to this week's call to prayer in the bulletin. Uh, continue to be praying for Violet Poppin. Uh, she's recovering with her family uh, down in the cities, but she's still in some pain, and, and uh, so continue to be praying for her. Uh, pray for Mary Bear as she's recovering from surgery. Uh, be praying for the family of Adrian Sundberg. He was a former pastor here for about six years, um, and he's now with the Lord, enjoying eternity uh, with Jesus. But uh, be praying for his family as they mourn his loss. And uh, continue to be praying for Dan Madura. He did get some bad news this week that uh, the cancer has spread to some other areas in his body, and he's going to need to start doing a, a new chemotherapy treatment. So uh, be praying for him and Shirley as they continue on this journey uh, with cancer and that the Lord would be sustaining them. And uh, I'll just echo what uh, Chet said, be praying for the uh, pastoral search committee and be praying for this new pastor that the Lord has lined up for us, um, and just be praying for the church, that the Lord would be blessing us with unity during this transition time. And our persecuted church of the week this week is China, so be praying for our brothers and sisters there. We, uh, it's amazing that the Lord has brought uh, possibly uh, more believers to his kingdom um, in China than there are now in the United States. Uh, we don't know for sure because it's sort of hard to get those numbers, but it seems like uh, there is a large and growing um, body of believers over there, and yet they are still um, highly persecuted. So be praying for them this week. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we thank you that we can come here today and worship you freely. Uh, we can gather with our brothers and sisters to um, sing songs about you that worship you in spirit and truth. And we can encourage one another's hearts with uh, encouraging words and just by singing together. And we thank you that we can be fed as your flock by your word preached today. And Lord, uh, we thank you. Uh, that this is all done without worry about our government coming to um, persecute us for doing this, Lord. So we lift up our brothers and sisters now that don't have these freedoms. We thank you that you've called them into your kingdom and that you are sustaining them with your grace. And we ask that you'd continue to do that. Give them boldness uh, as they are interacting with those who are persecuting them. Give them boldness uh, to share the gospel. We ask that you give them protection, that uh, things that they should be punished for will be overlooked or not seen. And Lord, may your kingdom, kingdom continue to spread in places like China and Iran and other very difficult places to live as a Christian. And Lord, we lift up our brothers and sisters who are going through pain, through um, suffering, uh, we ask that you would give them the hope uh, that they have in Christ, make it more real to them as they suffer these pains. We ask that you would preserve their faith, help them to not 
lose trust in you while they go through these, but open their eyes to help them see how your grace is sufficient for them and your power is made perfect in weakness. And Lord, we, we want to confess that we, uh, just like your people Israel, have, uh, have committed two evils. We've turned ourselves away from the fountain of living water, and we've turned to dig out uh, broken cisterns for ourselves to find satisfaction in the things that the world offers rather than finding our satisfaction in you. And yet, Lord, we have so much hope more than 10,000 reasons to hope, Lord, because of the promises you give your people who trust in you. Promises like if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So Lord, we, we ask that you'd help us to turn away from the things we're finding satisfaction in that are not you and turn to you and find our satisfaction in you. And Lord, we look forward to the day when you return and make all things new, and nothing in this world will distract us from you. And until we uh, get to that day, Lord, we thank you for good brothers like Brother Perry now, who's going to feed us with your word. We ask that your Holy Spirit would fill him so that he can proclaim your word with boldness and clarity. And Lord, help us with your spirit to receive that word gladly so that we can be uh, transformed, our minds can be renewed, so that we can love you better, obey you better, and trust you more. So we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'd like to uh, welcome up Pastor Perry here. He's been a, a longtime pastor at Opstead Baptist, and uh, he's now fellowshipping with his family down at Isle E. Free. So yeah. thank you for coming up. Thanks, Matt. Appreciate it. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you, Matt. It's good to be here um, at Glory. I, I hear that it's almost heaven. So um, anyway, uh, I really like the, the hanging here is, uh, from Ukraine. We still stay in touch with our pastor and his wife over in Ukraine and a lot of, well, a lot of people over there, I guess. It's been neat. One of the young guys that was in the day camp when we used to go over there, they just, he just had a, he and his wife just had a baby. And so it's, it's fun seeing, seeing them and just how the Lord has protected them so far. And so we're just really thankful for that. But uh, anyway, uh, today I want to talk about something that actually we've been singing about. It's pretty neat how the songs just went so much along with what I'm planning to speak about is God's truth and just all that we have to be thankful for. Um, it's been on my mind a lot, and I guess one of the things that I've been thinking a lot about is just how important it is for us to not go by our feelings. Um, and uh, we had a lady at Opstead, uh, Julie Midbow, some of you probably knew her, um, and uh, she, would, she led singing for many years, and she'd always start out by saying, this is the day the Lord has made. And if you knew what the we will rejoice and be glad in it. And, uh, you know, not too long ago, we, uh, Mary and I asked her, or Mary asked her, do you still say that every morning, Julie? And she said, well, sometimes not till after my first cup of coffee. <laughs> and uh, I know she's saying it every day now because she's with the Lord. But, uh, you know, uh, Julie would choose to make it a good day. I, I know that from just seeing her. She, she had a lot of things going on in her life, but she always chose to make it a good day because she knew the Lord. And uh, sometimes a little coffee helps, you know, but, uh, <laughs> but each day is a choice. And, uh, you know, we all have a choice. We always have something to be thankful for. And uh, we live in a world where feelings are becoming over, the most important thing. Um, and we really need to learn to live according to truth rather than our feelings. Is there any pilots here? Too bad. Um, anyway, one of the things in, in flying, uh, that uh, especially as you got to flying on instruments and getting an instrument rating, was you'd have a hood that you wore, and the hood 
went like this. So all you could see was just the instrument panel in front of you. And, um, and then very often the instructor would say, okay, close your eyes and put your head down. And then he'd take the plane and he'd do all kinds of stuff. And up, down, around, you know, and if you're familiar with your ears, you start doing that stuff and you get all messed up. And, uh, you know, then he would, after he's got it in some kind of a unusual attitude, maybe, you know, a turn to the right or whatever. Yeah, this is my right, okay. To the right, um, climbing, diving. Then he'd say, okay, it's your airplane. And then you look up and you look at the instruments and you know that you're turning to the left from your head. But the instruments don't say that. They say you're turning to the right. And so you have to decide, what am I going to go by? My head or my instruments? And uh, if you go by your head, you're going to get in big trouble. And that's where a lot of crashes come from, is when people start to go by their feelings rather than the instruments. We have to learn to go according to the truth. And uh, unusual attitudes really help me to, to learn that. And uh, in life, we must learn that very often our feelings will mislead us. Um, we have to check our feelings with the standard of God's truth and His Word, the reality of His, of his Word. And, you know, as you look around at the world today, if you listen to the news for maybe about five minutes, it can be very discouraging. <laughs> um, as you listen to what's happening, you talk about wars and rumors of war, uh, you know, with Russia and Ukraine, uh, North Korea, China, Iran, Israel, Hamas, Hezbollah, um, on and on and on. The Philippines is being pushed around. Uh, you know, th there's the whole woke agenda. There, you've got COVID coming back, uh, inflation, um, climate change. Uh, it, it's just, it's so easy to feel like the world is falling apart, which it is. I'm not going to deny that. But, uh, you know, on more personal levels, there's, you know, we see people destroying each other. Uh, Verbally, online, you know, social media does all kinds of stuff. You know, people are telling lies about other people. Um, there's, well, just teachers being assaulted in, in school. Mary, Mary's sister has been, some of the stuff that happens to her, you know, police being ambushed and murdered. Um, we see physical, mental abuse, cruelty, greed, Gender confusion, uh, it just, it goes on and on in our world. And our moral compass in our society really is not pointing to true north anymore. And I, I saw a book when Mary and I were up on the North Shore at a bookstore, and there was this book that said, Choose Your Own North Star. Well, that's kind of a neat title until you think about it. You think of the ramifications of everybody's choosing their own North Star. Um, <laughs> you know, it's crazy. Uh, and that's what's happening. But, you know, uh, whatever you feel like is your truth. That's, that's what we're told. That's what's truth for you. And that's what's happening in our world. Kind of reminds me of uh, back in Gen Genesis when uh, Satan came and told Adam and Eve, hey, <laughs> you can be just like God. You can do your own thing. You don't have to listen to God. And that's where we've been at a lot in our world is we're doing our own thing. We don't need to listen to God anymore, or at least we don't think we do. Um, and uh, so it uh, can feel very disorienting uh, in a world. You know, the society starts to crumble as everybody's choosing their own North Star. And uh, so we need to be, we're going to find ourselves in some real unusual attitudes in our, in our world. And we uh, you know, really don't know which end is up until we start to get according to the truth, according to God's truth in those unusual attitudes. We need to check our, our truth with God. Jesus said in uh, John chapter 16, uh, verse 33, he says, I've said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you'll have tribulation, but take heart. I've overcome the world. He said that right before he went to the cross. And uh, then in Luke 21, Jesus says again, Luke 21, verse 28, he says, Now, when these things begin to take place, the things are just what I've talked about 
what's going on in our world today. When you see these things uh, begin to take place, straighten up. Raise your heads because your redemption is drawing near. And, uh, you know, that's good news, meaning Jesus could be coming back very soon. I believe very, very soon. And that can be really thrilling and exciting to us if we know the Lord is our Savior. If we don't, it's something to be pretty concerned about. Um, but, uh, you know, as we turn in our focus to Jesus and his promises, it'll start to change the way that we think. And if we change the way that we think, it literally starts to change our life. That's uh, uh, just a, a, it's called renewing your mind. Remember in, in Romans 12 too, it says, you know, we start to renew our mind. It's by getting God's, God's word into our hearts and minds and start to change who we are. And today I'm going to talk about kind of four things, four principles that I got from a devotional by Craig Groeschel. You maybe heard of him, but uh, he's a pastor down in Life Church in Oklahoma in Life Church. But these are actually things that my wife had written many years ago, so it's not really new for Craig. He he just copied her, but uh, not really. But uh, you know, they're principles that we can apply to our lives to to bring our minds and our thinking under God's control, rather than what the world is saying, the world's lies. Uh, Remember who the father of lies is. It's, uh, you know, Jesus said in uh, John 8, 44, you are of your father, the devil, and, uh, and your, this, Jesus was talking like to religious leaders, okay? So in John 8, 44, he said, you are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and has nothing to do with the truth because there's no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character or his native language. For he's a liar and he's the father of lies. And that's who Satan is and that's our adversary. And so we need to learn that we can't go by what he says. So I'm going to just pray as we'll get started here a little bit more. Lord, I just pray that as we go through these things, these four points, that it'll be helpful to all of us to realize how important it is for us to go by your truth. And not what the world says, because the world is going to try to lie to us and confuse us, and we can get all disoriented and find ourselves in some really unusual attitudes, and we realize we need to get back to your truth, to your standards. Otherwise, we're just going to, we're going to fall for what the world has to say. So I just really pray that these points will be helpful for all of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, the first one is called replacement principle, or Mary calls it replacement theory, but anyway, whatever. Um, but just replace the lie with the truth. And as, you know, kind of going back to the uh, unusual attitudes thing, you know, in the airplane, you have to overcome your feelings by the truth of the instruments. The instruments aren't lying to you. Your mind is going to sometimes lie to you, and it's, you can get really messed up. So. So the first principle to controlling our minds is to allow God's truth to replace the lies that we've believed. You know, a lot of times, you know, people are, I've talked to a lot of people who said, you know, people have told me, you're worthless, or they feel like I'm so worthless. And, uh, you know, it's, it's not true. The Bible says, God says, I knit you together in your mother's womb. I designed you. You're fearfully and wonderfully made. That's from Psalm 139. That's one of my wife's favorite chapters also. Um, <laughs> my son wrote a song about it. My, my son, one son has a, wrote a song using Psalm 139. My other son has it tattooed on his arm. So anyway, not the whole song, but uh, anyway. <sighs> Did you know that you start out from two half cells? They come together at conception and they start to multiply, and uh, in nine months, you're, you have two trillion cells, approximately. Uh, two trillion. And that's, that averages out to be five, five million new cells per minute. That's a lot of dividing. I realize it's going slower at the beginning and a lot faster at the end, but just over the nine-month period, it averages out to be five, five million new cells per minute. That divides into heart, into lungs, into liver, into brain, 
into 60,000 miles of blood vessels. 60,000, that's twice around the world, more than. <laughs> You're a miracle. You really are a miracle. God says you are. He says he made us in his image. And uh, how important it is to start to accept the truth of what he says we are rather than what the world says we are. Um, so we need to, you know, replace lies with truth. Uh, you know, we can replace hate with love. Um, bitterness with joy. Anger with forgiveness. That's a huge one. You know, and I just, you know, are there things in your life that maybe you're believing in a lie? I just pray that God will maybe bring it to your mind of something that, that you're believing that is not truth according to his word. And you can start to replace that with the truth. You know, getting into God's word, it's so important for us to get into God's word and start to replace the lies with the truth. Okay, the, the next one is uh, called a rewire, rewire principle. I, I think this is pretty neat. Um, it says, create new pathways in your brain. It's interesting that science is now showing that we actually form neural pathways, ruts, in our brain um, by putting the same information in over and over and over. Uh, the Bible told us over 3,000 years ago that uh, for a man, as a man thinks, so is he. Um, so, you know, science and the Bible agree on this, but, uh, you know, we should pay attention when science and the Bible agree. And if the Bible says something, we need to pay attention to it anyway because start to find out that, the, that they'll, science will gradually catch up with the Bible. It's happening all the time. I might be speaking on that the next time I'm here. So, yeah. But uh, anyway, I love science. But you know, when science and the Bible agree, we, that, it's really cool. And the truth about this is that we can start to form good neural pathways in our brain or bad neural pathways in our brain. Um, literally ruts in our brain. The roads aren't quite like they used to be, but it used to be you got into one rut and you're gonna stay in it for a long time in the springtime around here. And, uh, but you know, the kind of ruts, it's so important to know what kind of ruts you're putting into your brain. And we need to be putting God's word into our brain. Um, so that we have his truth rather than what the world wants to tell us. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 8, um, Paul is talking there and he says, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about those things. You think of what, if you thought, if that's the kind of things that you're putting into your brain all the time, think of what a difference that would make. I, I've often used the example of being chained between two elephants, and they're pulling. And which elephant is going to win the battle? The one you feed. So important. What elephant are you feeding in your life? Because, you, you know, uh, anyway, I just like that, that picture to me of what's going to win the battle. Okay, the next one is called a reframe principle. Change how you perceive what's happening. Um, you know, we often find in life that we can't control what happens to us, but we can control how we frame it, how we look at it. Um, Paul had a strategy. Uh, he wrote to the church in Rome, the book of Romans that we have, and he had a strategy to go there on his way to trying to you know, spread the gospel to the world. He wanted to get to Rome, which was the capital of the world at that point, and to, to you know, reach the leaders there, that it could be a base for spreading the gospel all around the world. But when fi Paul finally got there, he was in chains. He was a prisoner, locked up, and uh, under house arrest. And he wrote the book of Philippians from that jail in, in uh, Rome. And uh, I just thought it was interesting, um, you know, what would you, what would you have said when you're there? He had great plans. Seemingly, they were, didn't go quite the way he, had, he expected. You know, I see, you know, as he wrote to the Philippians, he could have said, I want you to know, brothers, that what's happened to me really sucks. 
um, I was planning to share Christ with world leaders here in Rome, and now I'm locked up in prison. I give up on all this Jesus stuff. I'm not going back to church again. But that's not what he said. I just love, he reframed it. And in Philippians 1.12 and following, it just says, I want you, he's writing to the Philippians, people that he really loved, who cared about him. And he says, I want you to know, my brothers, that what's happened to me has really served to advance the gospel so that it's become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. What a, you know, I mean, he's, he's witness, witnessing to the, the imperial guard, these soldiers that are guarding him day and night. I imagine they got an earful of the gospel, you know, and they're becoming Christians and they're telling everybody else about it. So from prison, he's reaching the world. A little different way of doing it, but pretty effective. And, uh, you know, I just think that is so neat. But he reframed it. He didn't look at it in the negative way. He saw it from a positive way that God is allowing this for some reason. I don't know. I'm sure he didn't understand to start with. But he started to see God is working in this, in this way. Um, that's what we call reframing. Uh, kind of reminds, reminds us of, you know, Romans 8, 28. We know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. You know, it can be kind of hard if people come up to you when you're having some really big troubles and say, ah, you know, God's working this all for your good. Yeah, thanks. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it's true. But it's just neat, you know, it's, it's, you kind of say, well, yeah, that's good for you to say, but, you know, what would you do if it happened to you? Well, Paul wrote this verse before he wrote to the Philippians, and it's just neat to see how he responded when he was put in a situation like this, put into prison, um, and, you know, he was shipwrecked, remember, um, just all that happened, and, uh, but he did a great deal of reframing the whole thing. And uh, he was looking at what God was doing. And he realized that God is working in this in ways that I don't understand. But, you know, he brought, he brought me to, to this place to be able to witness to these guards. And these guards are spreading the gospel all over the imperial palace. So that's called a reframing. Um, and then... The last one that I've got, it's called the rejoice principle. Um, as we choose to thank God to rejoice and pray, God shows up and gives us his peace. And I've seen that so, so true in my life so many times. You know, it's, uh, you know, my dad is 99 plus and very weak and very confused. And yet God is giving him life for a reason and I just keep asking God you know help me Lord to learn everything I can through this and to be the son that God wants me to be rather than being oh brother why's my dad got to be like this because he's still he's still there he still knows me we can still talk it's pretty special and I need to realize how positive this is rather than looking at the negative on it. But, you know, this principle is uh, in Philippians 4, verse 4. It talk, Paul, again, is talking here, and he says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I'll say it again. Rejoice. Let your reasonableness or your, your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Don't be anxious about anything. Don't be anxious about anything. That takes a little bit to think, sink into. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your mind in Christ Jesus. You know, again, you know, like 
We don't have to ask God to be with us. I'm not saying it's wrong to ask God to be with us, but we don't have to ask him to be with us. He promises he's always with it. Never will I leave you or forsake you. We can start to thank him. You're right here with me, Lord. I don't understand what's happening, but you're here and you promise to work everything out for my good because I love you. You know, we need to start to thank him and rejoice. And, you know, it's great. To, it's easy to talk this stuff. It's a little tough to do it all the time. So I'm not saying I got it all wired. I'm just saying that's what God says. I'm trying to, trying to get there. But we need to rejoice in the Lord, not to be anxious, but to pray and thank him. And we'll have, he will give us his peace. And, uh, you know, Paul found himself in another unusual attitude, you might say, in uh, Acts chapter 16. And you may be familiar with it, but it's such a neat thing. As Paul and Silas, they were in Philippi. They're spreading the gospel there. And remember, there was that slave girl who had a demon in her, and she was a fortune teller, and her owners made big money on this fortune teller. And finally, Paul cast the demon out of her. The owners were ticked because she was their source of money, and now she's... Without the demon, she can't, she can't be doing the fortune telling anymore. And so they had Paul and Silas arrested. It says there that they were severely flogged. And if you know anything about Romans flogging, severely flogged means they were half dead. They were chained up, put into a maximum security prison. And uh, in Acts chapter 16, starting with verse 25, it says, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns, singing hymns to God. And the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once, all the prison doors flew open. Everyone's chains came loose. This was quite a, an earthquake. The jailer woke up, and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because if People got away. It was him, him or them. They were going to kill him if, if those guys had escaped. And uh, so he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul shouted, don't harm yourself. We're all here. The jailer called for lights, rushed in, and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out and asked, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Isn't that cool? <laughs> Verse 31 says, Paul said, Believe, or Paul and Silas said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. The jailer and his whole household were saved that night. It says that they all wanted to be baptized and they, but I mean, just remember that, just think of that situation from being beaten half to death to being in the jailer's own house and his, his whole household trusting in Christ. That was because Paul and Silas were rejoicing in what was going on, even though I'm sure they didn't understand it. And because of that, God showed up um, in a miraculous way. Um, they rejoiced, and then God showed up. It wasn't that God came and then they, oh, I guess we can be thankful now. No, they chose to be thankful in the terrible situation. And as they did that, God worked in some amazing ways. And uh, I'm sure a lot of the prisoners that heard that maybe came to Christ too. I don't know that. But we know that the Philippian church, that was one of the beginnings of the Philippian church. And uh, God used that church in great ways. You know, uh, this is a crazy world right now. <laughs> and we're going to have more and more and more unusual attitudes come hitting us. And so uh, crazy and unexpected things are happening in our world. And uh, we need to apply these principles in our lives. Um, you know, the replacement principle to replace lies with truth. <clears throat> uh, the re rewire principle, you know, to create those new pathways in our brain. Literally, the renewing of our mind. That's what, that's what it's called in, in uh, Romans 12 there. You know, to... Renew our minds with God's word, getting his, his word, his truth into our minds rather than what the world says. The world's going to try to tell you all kinds of stuff. We need to go by what this book says. Um, the reframe principle. 
Change how you perceive what's happening. You know, um, is the cup half full or half empty? Makes a big difference. You know, we can look, how we look at things ch- changes our whole attitude. God says, you know, to rejoice in him always. Again, I say rejoice, no matter what. Um, and then the rejoice principle, as we choose to thank God to rejoice and pray, God shows up and gives us his peace. Um, you know, and sometimes it's pretty tough to say thank God for this situation, but we can thank God in this situation. We, might, we don't understand why something is happening, but we can thank him in this situation because he promises to be working in this situation for our good, no matter, you know, what's happening around us. And that's what he's asking us to do, is to start to thank him in every situation because he's with us. He promises to do that. You know, from that prison in Rome, as Paul wrote to the Philippians, he also said this um, in Philippians chapter 1, verse 20. It says, It's my eager expectation and hope that I will not be at all ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. And I hope you have that hope, that we're living according to that hope. Um, You know, today, as we prepare for communion, we're going to be focusing on that hope, of why we can have hope, because of what Jesus did. We celebrated that just a, a week ago, as he rose again, but he died first. And so let's just pray as we get ready for communion and just kind of start to focus on that. Father, I thank you so much for well, this season as we've just gone through Holy Week and as we went through the, the Last Supper and then your death on the cross on Good Friday and then your resurrection on Easter Sunday. And I hope that's really fresh in our minds yet as we think of all that you did for us, just your love. You proved your love on Calvary. We can't doubt that as we start to think about all that you did for us. And so I thank you for that. I just pray now as we prepare our hearts and minds for communion that it'll be just a very special time of remembering that, remembering what you did, to remember that you were beaten mercilessly and just can't imagine all you went through for us, Lord. God doing that for us. God washing feet. God humbling himself. We, you said to do the same as you. Help us to have that attitude of humility and love for those around us, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so, well, we'll go ahead and do communion. Um, I'll just, uh, I'm just going to say this, and like I said, talking about Easter and the resurrection, and as Jesus died <clears throat> to pay the penalty for our sins, uh, just we're remembering his broken body and shed blood, you know, in communion, and it's, it's a thing that we've been doing as believers for 2,000 years. You know, this is not a new thing at all. It's just so neat how God has given us this special, simple, simple way in a profound way of remembering his broken body and his shed blood and remembering that Jesus did that for you and for me, for us personally. And uh, I know Glory has open communion. I, if you're a visitor, I don't know who's visitors, who's not, so I'll just say, but you know, if you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, please join us. This is a special time, a family thing. It's for believers to remember what Jesus did for us on the cross. So I'll just, uh, again, just thank the Lord and then we'll pass out the, the cup and the bread. Thanks, Lord, uh, again, for what you did. Help us to remember the truth of that. The world tries to say all kinds of stuff, but you died and it's a historical fact. We're not just believing some kind of tales. Many, many historians who are not Christians wrote about what you did. So we thank you for that and help us just to really get this in our minds of remembering this truth wherever we're going. What a difference it makes as we realize your love for us. 
in your name. Amen. do this. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See if I can get this apart without spilling it. Huh? What's that? Bottom first. Bottom first. Oh, okay. I would spill. Okay, I was just about ready to. So, okay, that's cool. So, well, we'll uh, if you want to open up the bottom and uh, get the bread out, we'll uh, just remember Jesus' broken body and shed blood. And I'll just, I'm just going to thank him for that quick, right before we eat. Thanks, Lord, again for what you did for us. Help us as we eat this bread. Just remember, as you said, this is my body. Thank you that you died, that your body was so severely beaten and disfigured. It says in Isaiah that it was beyond human recognition. Thank you that you did that for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's go ahead and eat together. Okay, now you can open up the top. Okay. Hopefully if I drink it before I spill it, we'll be in good shape. So uh, again, I'm just going to thank the Lord for this. Lord, thanks for your shed blood. Just think as they poked the spear into your side and blood and water came out mixed as you were dead on the cross. We thank you. Thank you for what you did. 
Thank you for shedding your blood for us, for our forgiveness of our sins. Help us to live according to the love that you've shown us. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, I think Chet is going to do a, a song or lead us in a song, so. Please join us in singing our closing song. I had, I had notes written out, and of course I didn't get all the way through them. On the survey, uh, just a reminder, it is an anonymous survey. You do not need to put your name on it. You can fill out as much or as little of the survey as you'd like, and certainly some of the questions may not be applicable. If your children are, are, are adults or, or gone from the house, you don't need to put your children's ages if, if that's not appropriate or applicable. Uh, the important things on the survey, though, there's a few questions that are extremely important. We'd love to hear what you think the current strengths and also areas of opportunity that we have here at Glory. Where are you being blessed? What are the things that are keeping you coming back each and every week? And also, where do you see that we have some room to grow in certain areas? And then there's also a question that lists about 10 different qualities of a, of a pastor, which do you think are the most important of those? Okay, so those are the few things. Again, it's anonymous. Fill out as much as you'd like, but please give us the information about what you enjoy and what you think we can improve. 
and what you're looking for in the next pastor. With that, I'll let you close, Perry. Search committee, that's a huge job. And I know they're putting a lot of time into it. So really pray for them that God will really lead them to the right person because what a difference it makes as you get the person that is meant for your church, the pastor that's meant for your church. And just uh, so, anyway, thank you. And let's just close in a word of prayer. Father, thanks again for this time. Thanks for the worship team. What a beautiful song to close in. And just for their help in the service. And I just really thank you for glory. Just guide them as a church as they search for a new pastor. Just bring the right person to them that will really help the church to grow in you and grow closer to you and to reach out in the community. So I just thank you for that a big job. Thank you, most of all, for Jesus and what he did for us as we've remembered that in communion. Help us to not forget that, but to leave, as we leave, to apply that, that truth of your love, that truth of what you did for us, and may that affect us in our walk every day as we remember that. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. Get rid of this.